teaches widely, researches, and serves on several industry best practice committees. He was previously with IBM, Lucent Technologies, and AT&T. For Isaka, he serves on the IT Enterprise Risk Management Task Force, the program committees for the IT, GRC, and North America CACs conferences, the core faculty for the IT and uh, Governance Forum, and the Professional Influence and Advocacy Committee. Let me invite Mr. Brian. Please welcome. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here with you this morning on the Join Your Conference. Uh, what a fantastic uh, program you have with the IT Governance Insurance Forum. Pulling everybody together, gaining focus, gaining alignment, as our previous speaker said. It's a tremendous compliment to the work that you've all done, and of course, a great benefit in driving forward that alignment and the progress that I've heard that you've all made in a very, very short period of time. So it's just tremendous, and I'm very honored to be here with you today. Today in our discussion, we want to take a look and step back at some of the problems that people are facing. As I go around the world, as I talk to different audiences and groups, whether it's in my continuing professional education training, through best practices committees, through my advisory work that I do with companies, whatever it is, I hear people asking questions about how do we get better in IT governance? What do we do to take it to the next level, to get to the next step? to drive more business benefit. These are just a few of the kinds of questions that I've been hearing recently from people as we talk about these issues. The first one comes from a hospital that I talked with in New York just three weeks ago, two weeks ago. And the gentleman sat down with me in the CIO's office and he said, Brian, we need to figure out how to do better metrics around IT because the business, referring to the rest of the hospital, wants to understand where the value is coming from. So that's a big question that's out there today. Another one is a government that I was talking to, trying to determine how to prioritize and balance two different areas. One is all the departments, and then the operations and new project activities that were going on. The business applications, the business initiatives, separated from the IT, and then the IT on which they depend and connect. And so the two go together. Another way the problem came up was within a large municipal government I was dealing with, and it's very large, so I won't name it, I don't want to embarrass them, but I sat down with the gentleman who was the deputy CIO, and he said, my boss is concerned about our governance. He's concerned that it's becoming too much of a feed the monster paperwork exercise. We just create paper and forms and reports and we give them to the big monster. And it feels like we're slowing down our business decision making. We need to go faster. How do we get over this? And that's what his question was that he was asking. Another person came in and they said, you know, we've put this in place. They're an insurance company uh, dealing with property and casualty mostly. And they said that we, we were worried that we were making too many fast decisions, doing too many things too quickly. And so we put in governance to structure it. But when we did, now we started slowing down too much. The pendulum swung. And how do we get back to the right balance? And the last example I, I'll use is another example of governance that came from a manufacturer, where they were very concerned about everybody agreeing and everybody building consensus. And what they ended up doing was everybody agreed to everything to agree to everybody else's project. The problem, of course, was they didn't have enough resources to do everything. So they had to go back and prioritize all over again when the budget became tight. So in governance, it's like organizational structures or so many other things. The pendulum can swing from one side to the other. And you have to find a way to get the right balance for the right organization in the right business environment at the right time. That way, you can get that effective governance activity happening. And leaders are seeking better ways to do this. Now problems, of course, if you're not doing those things right, can cost you time, or can cost you money, or both. And in these days of economic difficulty, as our distinguished chairman told us in his keynote address, that's becoming more and more difficult. We can't afford to make mistakes. We can't afford to try to do everything. We have to focus. So how do we get to find a little better way to work? 
This gentleman here, he just passed away a few months ago. He was the oldest man in the world, almost 114 years old. If you plan on being in your job until you're 114 years old, you've got lots of time to work these things out. But most people don't have that much time. So we need to think about how can we be more efficient and how can we be more effective? What's a better way? Well, we turn to best practices. And of course, I'm here and others are here and I've already heard you talk about ISACA and best practices. That's fantastic. You've embraced those things. You've embraced the learning from other people around the world. ISACA now has about 90,000 constituents around the world in about 160 countries. I recently chaired the IT Governance Risk and Compliance Conference in the United States. At that one conference, we had 20 countries represented. Where I met Mr. Nalen two years ago, we had 60 countries represented in Toronto for the international conference. There's a lot of learning that's out there to build and to grow on through best practices. Now, one of the perspectives I bring and I share through my volunteer work with ISACA and with all of you today is a variety of best practices and standards committees. These are just some that I sit on. And when I'm sitting around the table with Mr. Rafiq and others at ISACA, we're all on multiple committees. And so we can touch almost every best practice that's in the world. One of our international vice presidents is on multiple committees as well. And we sit and we talk and we share. So we can find almost everything. We also understand what's going right and what's going wrong. And one of the things that's wrong <laughs> is there's a lot of best practice out there. I'm on the core team for the new risk IT from ISACA. And based upon the feedback we got from members around the world, we've added more and added more and added more. Our first draft that we had in February was 100 pages, our public exposure draft. Now we're almost 300 pages after we pulled in all the good ideas that everybody had and the things that people wanted us to write about. It can become overwhelming. People can ask, where do I start? How do I improve? And so we have a practical perspective to share with you today, just Brian's view of how I can try to help you. The first one is through industry best practices committees. This happens to be a picture of some of the people on the Risk IT Task Force. But as I mentioned, we meet from all around the world, and we connect, and we talk, and we share. The second perspective I have to share is through my classroom teaching. This year. I'll probably be with, oh, 12, 1,500 people by the time the year's done and I'm through my last program in December. Just la and that doesn't count the things like the virtual uh, webinar I did for ISACA just last Tuesday where I had about 700 people from around the world listening and learning. But as I hear your questions and I hear your concerns and I hear your comments, that's another perspective that I get from you. In fact, one thing that's important to note and how seriously we take being out here with all of you is that I was supposed to be in Chicago tomorrow for an ISACA committee meeting where people were coming in from South Africa and Australia and France and countries all around the world. But after I was invited here, we sat and we talked and we said, it's much more important for me to be here working with you who have the questions and are wondering and to be of assistance to you than it is for me to be in Chicago with the rest of the committee. So that's a perspective. Another one is through the research I did. This happens to be a picture of a research paper I did with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Center for Information Systems Research, where we went out and we surveyed 258 people from around the world. 100 of those were IT people that we surveyed. 158 were business people, because we wanted to understand the intersection of business and IT. And then the last perspective is a role I have working around the world with clients. When I was at IBM, I led the IT governance, risk, and compliance community of practice for the entire world for IBM, across all industries, across different sized companies. And that allowed me to talk to both our consultants and to the customers in what they were doing and hear their concerns. So these are the four perspectives that I bring. Very, very practical. What works, what makes a difference? And so today we'll look at a couple areas. First, we'll focus on these three improvements. These will be sort of our touchstones. How do we make improvements in these areas around balancing maturity in the five focus areas of IT governance from ISACA, clarity of business outcomes focus, and our previous speaker just talked about that quite a bit, that customer service focus, and then efficiency and effectiveness of the governance process. Again, we don't want to feed the monster. 
And then we'll have 10 practices very quickly, sort of like a top 10 list you might see on television or something, 10 tips to share with you that can help you go to that next level. So first, let's look at those three areas. And here they are. In looking at these pieces, we tie them together. Now, you won't find this in any particular Isaka document, not yet. But we look at having clarity of focus outcomes. And you see some of that in the documents. So we're trying to shine more of a flashlight on that, if you will. Then we have the maturity across the five focus areas. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. And then the governance efficiency and effectiveness. And what's really important here is that you as IT governance leaders and IT leaders and change agents in your organization can make a difference with this. And when people hear you saying and talking about governance, they see that as being something that will accelerate their progress, will accelerate their business to get to that life cycle of events that we saw on your portal just a moment ago. How can we service our customers, those three customer areas that were addressed more easily and efficiently? So there's a balance, a balance we're trying to reach, and I've already mentioned this. What I'm going to share with you now are these 10 practical tips. And remember, these have to be tailored, and that's actually maybe one of our last tips, is talk about tailoring a little bit. But the point here is that looking at the research, looking at the feedback I'm getting, is that these things tend to be things that differentiate stronger organizations from organizations that aren't quite as strong. Now, not everybody's going to be great on all 10, just like anything in maturity. But looking at these areas tend to be associated with organizations that are moving more quickly toward effectiveness. So these are performance characteristics that you can consider applying in your own environment that will differentiate you from other organizations. IT. For example, I'll talk to somebody in security and they'll say, I'll ask them, what's your business goal? And they'll say, oh, my business goal is that I am trying to uh, fix my uh, firewalls and patch my systems more quickly and that'll help me reduce downtime. It's a good business goal, right? And I said, well, what's your business goal? If you go to a business line owner, what is their performance being measured on? What is expected by the customer? It probably isn't firewalls or software patching. It's probably something more like customer service, response times, new application development, ability to do something that some business person wants to do. And those are the things that they're measured on for their performance and their compensation. Those are real business objectives. Real business objectives, as it mentioned in the tip there. And we can break them into three categories, those end customer metrics, the change activities. How quickly can an organization change? That's very important in these days, so that you're not stuck and you're not frozen. People describe to me sometimes, our governance, it's in our IT shop, it's like a boat anchor. It slows us down. How do we make IT go more quickly and effectively? So that's where you want to get to. Now, you don't have to read this chart. It's available as an ISACA download. It's a piece of research that came from some academic colleagues. Uh, it was just uh, completed uh, last year, and it's been published over the end of 2008 and the beginning of 2009. The point I want to make on this chart is highlighted in this big red line around this last column. These are the maturity dimensions that you should be familiar with from using COVID or anything else. They went through and looked at these 51 companies, measured their maturity. A darker color indicates higher maturity than a lighter color. Look at the one area that jumps out at you on this chart that's the lowest in maturity. Business goals, something that COVID has been talking about for years, something that we all stand up and talk about. It's still the weakest area in these survey of 51 companies. So align and focus to those goals.